Good afternoon and welcome to the final day of our webinar week from the Match Project. My name is Lasse and throughout this series of webinars, I have been your hostess with the mostest. During the week, we have been using insights from our Match platform to investigate key dimensions for circular readiness. And today we're presenting the final two dimensions. The webinars so far have covered one general introduction to the Match platform, Tuesday, the dimension of organization, followed by strategy and business model innovation. Wednesday, we covered product and service innovation along with manufacturing and value chain. And yesterday, we focused on technology and data and use support and maintenance. They are all available to stream on our website under the webinars tab. This episode will be recorded as well. Thank you all for presenting you in the chat. I can see that we even have people from the US joining us. So good morning to you over there. And just a reminder for everyone, when you send these messages, make sure that you select uh, everyone rather than just sending it to the panelists, of course, uh, if you want to share it with everyone. I'm sure you have lots of questions underway for our two speakers today, and you can raise those in the Q&A function here in the bottom of your screen. During the previous webinars, we have received more than 80 questions, so keep up the good and active engagement. As with the other webinars, we will be spending 20 minutes on the topic, this time take back and end of life strategies, backed by some industry specific data from our platform. During this, we want your input uh, through a survey tool called Mentimeter. So please have your phone or an extra uh, browser window ready for that. This leaves us with five minutes for questions. After that, we will do a three minute break to transition to the next topic of policy and market, which is the final topic of this series of webinars. You can stay on the line while we prepare for the next topic because the link and the meeting room here is, is the same for both webinars. Perhaps you can uh, use the short break to grab a Friday beer in the fridge. The first topic, take back and end of life strategies is introduced by Tim McAloon, who is the lead of the match project. He has for the past decades, if not centuries, been researching on sustainable design uh, and product service systems and circular economy. He will be assisted by our colleague, associate professor, Daniela Picasso, who has a background in industrial and environmental engineering. For the past few years, he has been head of studies for the design and innovation engineers here at DTU and made sure that circular economy and sustainability is in the forefront of the education for the future design engineers. As you can tell, they are both experts in their field. So I challenge you all to uh, shoot as many questions as possible. I'm sure they can answer all of them. With that said, Tim, you get to kick off the first presentation today. Thank you, Leza. And hello to everybody. And we're really happy that we're, um, we've had a really great week of webinars and we're happy to present these final two to you. So we have a whole set that you can go back and look at later on uh, after today. So as Lassa mentioned, we're going to talk to you today about uh, take back and end of life strategies first until half past the hour and then policy and market after that. So let's get on uh, with that without further ado. So basically uh, to focus on take back and end of life strategies. First question is, what is the motivation for take back and end of life strategies? And what does it mean to be ready uh, as a company for take back and end of life? of uh, one's products. The first interesting uh, fact here is that 39% of EU citizens, according to Euro uh, Barometer, consider product take back offered by the manufacturer as a deciding factor for buying long lasting products. Interestingly, uh, Denmark is actually one of the, uh, the, the lowest in that uh, with just 22% of the citizens uh, considering product take back. And I think it was uh, Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic rather uh, as being the, uh, the, the highest with 47%. But on the whole, on average, 39% of EU citizens be uh, wanting to look at product take back um, offered by the manufacturer. 
And this is something which is increasing over time. What does it mean to actually take your product back and to, to close the loop? Here we've taken a, an example from one of our other projects, a research project, which uh, is uh, not a Danish focus, but a Nordic focus project called Circuit. And down in the bottom corner here, you can see one of our workbooks. We have six workbooks in this project. And this one by Jose Hildenbrandt uh, and colleagues uh, is called Closing the Loop for a Circular Economy. And I just want to uh, skip you through this workbook, uh, which uh, we have here for, uh, for you to, to download for free and to, to look at, because it's got some interesting insights here in terms of end of life and product take back. First of all, I'm going to skip to the, what we call our circular strategy scanner from this project, because this basically is looking at all different types of circular economy strategies. A lot of them to do with taking products and systems back. At the top here, we're looking at business model and uh, different ways of rethinking and reconfiguring the, the business. The yellow area is about reinventing our business. The green area is about uh, designing, manufacturing and operating our products for uh, circularity so that we keep them on the market for longer and sharing uh, products and so forth. And here, the blue and the gray areas, you can say, are the take back strategies for a circular economy. We have them, the blue ones in terms of parts and products and the gray ones in terms of materials. And the way in which we look at this, uh, this uh, our circular strategy scanner, as we call it, is that the absolute last option should be to go for the gray area. So this is the, uh, the linear economy, we could say, is, is shortcutting this scanner and going all the way to the, to the end of life, to, the, to the, the dumping or the landfill or the incineration. And what we're doing here is trying to work our way backwards up to um, making sure that all the value we're putting into our products and systems when we're creating them is retained for as long as possible. But what now when we have products on the market, uh, companies have products on the market for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. What about those that are already out there? Um, how about uh, when they are, are spent, how to get those back, what to do with them when we take them back, and what are the different options that we have? So in this particular focus on product take back and recycling, uh, we're looking at uh, recirculating materials and recirculating parts and products. And we have a number of strategies going from the, you could say the worst case to recovering materials, cascading, recycling, up to slightly better is repurposing parts or components or even whole products, remanufacturing, refurbishing, reuse, repair and maintenance and upgrading. So these are all the different strategies here. And in this book, we basically have um, a, I'm just gonna flick a few pages now, because what we basically have here is um, some description of all of these different strategies, a, a description of the, the upgrade. What is, does it mean to upgrade and uh, update, modernize our products and get that back out on the user? And here we see, we show some, um, some routes to take from production to the user to upgrading and getting that back out again. We're showing the logic uh, approach of that. Or it could be to repair and maintain our product. And we can only do that, of course, if the product is designed for so, or rather it's best if we have designed the product for so uh, to be recirculated uh, from a repair and maintenance perspective. Or maybe we're looking at reuse. So reusing the, the parts or components uh, in, in some way from one part of the product a primary user reusing to a secondary user. It could be refurbishing. So making sure that we're collecting, wiping uh, data, for example, if it's a computer, repairing for functionality uh, improvements, and then giving some touch-ups from the aesthetics and putting it back out onto the market for the original user or a secondary user. And it could be that we're looking at remanufacture, uh, actually going in and mechanically reworking the product and, and maybe additively adding extra layers and machining away so we, we have works like new uh, situations. And then finally, on the parts and products, it could be to repurpose. And we showed you an example in one of our previous webinars, this beautiful example of uh, Copenhagen Village, where they've been repurposing old shipping containers to student housing in Copenhagen. I'm not going to go through the materials recirculation ones, uh, because there's also a, a number on the materials uh, pers perspective there. What I'd like to do instead is to show you 
a decision tree that we've also made. It's also in the book, which basically is helping you to make a decision about what now when we get the product back, what are the, the questions we can ask ourselves and how do we actually guide ourselves from the one uh, perspective to, to or from the answer to one question to a strategy going forward. So you can look from, is there a demand for the products in the market? No, then we go to looking at the recycle, cascade and recover of the, you could say the materials and components. And if there's a demand for the products in the market, maybe we should focus on recirculation of the parts of the product and a number of strategies here, a way of guiding our way through this here. So that's basically what the, the motivation for take back and end of life readiness is. So what we've done in a match perspective and to come back to the match project is to say, how ready are the companies that we've been surveying and the companies which have been using our tool in terms of their own take back and end of life strategies. And what we're basically doing is helping you to make, to measure your capabilities to ensure that uh, we're maximizing the end of life or what we nowadays call end of use uh, opportunities that we see for our products or systems. For that, we have a series of questions, of course. And before I start to uh, ask those questions, I'll just remind you of uh, the fact that, uh, that Lassa told us that we're going to be doing a survey. So what I'd like you to do is before I start asking the questions, I'd like to encourage you to go to our menti.com survey, either on your mobile or on a different browser. Um, don't close this browser, but go to a different browser and then use the code 2021650. So that's menti, E M E N T I dot com, and use the code 2021650. I'll keep this on the, the bottom of the screen while I uh, show you which questions we're basically uh, uh, asking in the platform. And what we're basically doing today is to get a straw poll from you while you're watching this webinar to see what you feel that your readiness is uh, in your, from your perspective. And don't worry, it's anonymous. So uh, we're just taking a poll to make a comparison of the data that we're going to show you in a few uh, minutes. So while you're doing that, you can listen to the questions as I describe them and maybe answer them as I describe them. So the first question we have here in the platform for, um, for Take Back uh, uh, is in terms of how far is your company or your business unit in establishing take back systems for products after their use. So you saw many of the different examples uh, that I was showing also on the pictures from the, the workbook there, we're showing products when they're becoming, uh, they've been taken back and they're being refurbished or upgraded or remanufactured. But how about getting them back? How ready is your company or your business unit within the company in terms of the reverse logistics? How do we ma manage to get these products and systems back? Is it something you're not doing at all? Is it something you're planning to do? Is it something that you're actually starting to, to pilot? Are you piloting just now? Or are you scaling it up? Or have you scaled it up already? The next question that you'll see also in the Menti is how far is your company or your business unit in terms of disassembling and remanufacturing products so that they can be sold to other customers? So where the first question was looking at actually getting the products back from a logistics perspective. This question is about um, what is your readiness in terms of being able to have a, you could say a reverse manufacturing process to take a product, to disassemble it, to uh, inspect it, to make sure that uh, the different uh, qualities of products go into the right channels uh, and, and become updated or upgraded or refurbished or repaired or what have you, depending on their quality and their condition. Uh, how ready are you and your organization to, to do this? And then the third and final question in this um, uh, dimension is about recovering value. So how far is your company or your business units in terms of recovering the value out of products at end of life? That means through material recovery. So uh, as an example, at least. So how, how ready do you think you are in terms of when you, number one, with the logistics, get the product back. Number two, are able to uh, open up and take back, uh, sorry, uh, dis disassemble and inspect the product to thirdly, actually getting the, uh, the value out of products and maybe combining to, to new offerings or new, new combined products on a refurbished market. So those three questions. 
And I can tell you before we go on to the next uh, 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 slide where we're going to ask Daniela to give us some of the insights that we've got from the platform, that the, uh, the interesting thing is that um, met, some companies are, are quite a long way on this and, and, and dedicated to this, but many, many are not started yet. So keep answering the mentee. There's only three questions here. And then uh, while Daniela is presenting, I'll see if we can get the results. So Daniela, how's it going for the companies in this area in terms of their readiness for take back and end of life strategies? Yes, let's have a look into that. And uh, all the data that I'm going to show to you just now comes from more than 900 different users that are currently engaged in the Match platform. They are spread over 38 different countries, which give us a quite good representation of the world status in terms of circular economy. And they are from more than 300 companies across 16 sectors. And the data you are seeing just now is focused on manufacturing companies. And what we can see here is that in average, uh, those companies, they are about 40% in their way to full readiness in the take back and end of life strategies. So they got six out of 15 possible points in the overall score. What we can also see here is that the two areas where it seems to be a slightly higher readiness has to do first of all with take back systems. Uh, where in average companies are planning the pilot implementation, but we can already see a number of companies scaling up and planning is scaling up uh, as well. And also in relation to materials recycling, which is actually the dimension with the highest uh, readiness in, in this specific area. And here we can see a good distribution of companies and a good pipeline moving towards uh, scaling up uh, initiatives. And uh, we actually expect that to be a little bit higher than it is just now, especially in relation to materials recycling, because this is the first thing that companies actually uh, think or start doing when trying to implement circular economy. And then if you look into disassembly and remanufacturing, what we can see here is that these uh, many of the companies have yet not started or are trying to understand what's the potential for implementation. And let's just remember that at the point that we managed to put parts and components back into the market, that's where we can really keep most of the value uh, and bring all of the advantages of circular economy, not least from a sustainability point of view, but also from a business uh, perspective. If you look in relation to the type of the different companies, we can see that uh, business to business, business to government and business to consumer have a very similar uh, readiness in that dimension. And the same goes for uh, the size of the companies. Here, with an interesting insight that micro uh, companies are the ones with the highest uh, readiness here. So the ones with less than 10 employees. What's also interesting to see is the readiness by sector where we see food and beverage as the sector with the highest readiness in relation to take back and end of life strategies. And if we click on it to uh, try to see how the data changes, it's actually extremely interesting to see that companies in this sector, they are already at full scale in taking back um, packaging after the end of life but also at recycling uh, the materials, which shows a very uh, interesting result of the take back schemes that we have implemented in that industry for quite many years now in, in many European countries, but this is also spreading uh, around the world. And then the other sector I wanted to have a look together with you here today is the electronics sector. You know that from a political point of view, there's a lot of focus on the waste of electric and electronic equipment and some very high uh, requirements in terms of recycling rates. But we can also see that the readiness in that sector is not that high, uh, being actually lower than, it, than the average across all the different sectors. So if we click uh, in here, what we can see, it's a complete different picture 
where the highest redness is actually in the disassembly and remanufacturing uh, area, which shows that for the products that are taken back, uh, companies are really trying to understand how they can retain most of the value by reusing components with a very high aggregated value. But on the other side, there is still uh, a smaller focus on both taking back those products, but also on recycling the materials. So some interesting uh, data for us to try to understand how companies in the manufacturing uh, industry today are taking back and implementing end of life strategies. Now back to you, Tim. Thanks, Daniela. So let's have a look at uh, what you answered in terms of your own readiness. So if we look at uh, what you answered on the, on the mentee, if I see if I can get this up for us, there we go. So we were 17 people that uh, actually took part in this. I know there's lots of uh, researchers and lots of consultants among the, uh, the many we have online today. So some of you abstain from answering, but in terms of how far is your company or business unit in, in establishing take back systems for products after their use? Um, 10 out of the 17 that answered have not started are still understanding the potential. One is planning the pilot implementation and six are piloting initiatives. So somehow mirroring what uh, Daniela has just showed us in the data. So uh, interesting to see that there. How can we make that better is the, uh, is the question. In terms of how far your company or business unit is in terms of disassembling and remanufacturing products so they can be sold to other customers, uh, even less ready, you could say. So uh, compared to the one before where we had uh, six at least piloting initiatives and one planning and pilot implementation, here we have just three of the company representatives in the room uh, today in this webinar uh, piloting initiatives. And that would be nice to hear. Maybe you could type it in the, in the Q&A if you like, uh, who you are, uh, which companies, only if you'd like to. And then there's 14 who have not started uh, doing that. And then finally, in terms of how uh, far is your company and business unit in terms of recovering the value out of products at end of life, that's interesting. So from the now 16 people that answered this part of the survey, one of you are actually scaling up initiatives or fully implementing. That would be really wonderful to hear if you'd like to share who you are. Two of you uh, planning the scale up, two uh, representatives here, piloting initiatives, two to planning to do that, and just nine out of those 16, 17 that answered before um, have uh, are still just on the, the starting uh, realm. So here we can see a clear need to boost the readiness. And this is completely in line with what we've been seeing in the, uh, the match platform as well. So thank you to those uh, 17 of you for, for participating in this part of the, of the survey. So with that, that actually brings us to the end of what we had to present for you. And I hope that there's some questions and uh, uh, well, answers will come from us, hopefully, but I hope there's some questions in the, uh, the chat there, in the Q&A uh, part. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Lessa, to see uh, if you can uh, guide us through any of the questions that have uh, arrived. Definitely. And Tim, the, the first question is for you. That's from Heather. And yep. she asks, um, what is needed to boost uh, the take back performance of companies? And is it always a sustainable uh, idea or to do so? Right. So, so to boost the take back, of course, it needs to be, um, you could say, worthwhile doing it. So it, that will, of course, depend on the product and the product type and the market and the sector. Um, we've seen here in, in, in Denmark, I've, I've been living here in Denmark for, for 20 something years. And over the years, and also looking back on what was been going on before I arrived in the country, I've seen that there's been different experiences with um, what do people do with their old car, depending on how much money you can get back for it when you uh, uh, have finished with it and it needs to go to the recycling center. Um, if you don't get anything, then some people, or if you have to pay, then it gets dumped in the forest. If you get uh, something for it, then of course, uh, it's an incentive to drive it to the right place uh, and so forth. And that's just one simple example. And I think that's seen in many other countries too. And I think that, um, of course, the value needs to be there for the company. Uh, one example we didn't bring up today was uh, uh, your telephone. Um, there is uh, just about all of the periodic system 
in our smartphones, uh, which means there's also gold and silver and all sorts of different precious materials in there. And uh, it's not just through the goodness of their heart that in Apple stores around the world, they will offer to take back your product and maybe offer you um, some money in, in the form of a voucher on your next purchase for your product. And you may have seen their adverts on the internet about um, the, the robots that they have. I can't remember the name. I think Liam was the first one and they have another one now. Uh, taking these telephones to pieces and computers. That's, of course, a great sustainability story, but it's also because they can see that this is their product, it's their materials, it's their components. And if they can uh, manage to get them back through their channels of their, their outlet stores, then of course they can trust completely what grade of aluminium they're using, uh, they're getting back because it's their own product. So I think there's some really great examples out there um, in, in different areas, but it doesn't um, go for all product types, of course. Is it always sustainable? No, it's not from an environmental perspective. Not necessarily. Uh, the, the minute we start to spend too many resources environmentally to get the products back uh, in terms of uh, um, what we can get out of them, we're doing it wrong. So we need to find out the right reverse uh, logistics solutions. And Tim, you say that uh, there are uh, gold in our phones mm. um, and in within Europe, uh, the electronics industry has to uh, adhere to the waste uh, electronic directive, but also the extended producer responsibility. Can you elaborate on why they performed so poorly in the data set that uh, Daniela just presented? Yeah, I think so. We it, the the uh, the WE directive, as it's called, the Waste Electrical Electronic Equipment Directive, um, has been around for for many years. In fact, in the early '90s, I was part of doing a survey in the UK to see what the potential was in the UK market for this thing that we, they were calling the WE directive that was going to be developed. So it's as old as that. But I think that what's going on now is we have a a, a voluntary. Um, uh, a system in each country for the WE directive, how to actually uh, manage to, to do that take back system. And the way in which the directive is working is that I think that uh, it's being seen just now how each country tackles the way in which they take their electronics back. So far, we don't have any uh, developed um, directives at the European level, if we, if we stay within Europe, uh, to my knowledge at least, which are starting to put higher uh, levies on actually taking back. But what we're doing is putting a levy on through the WE directive on products which are, um, are manufactured and sold within the European Union. And then on top of that, we have the so-called eco-design directive, which is uh, telling us how to, it's not so much about the, the, uh, the, the take back of it as it is about the actual, uh, the design and the energy usage of our products. Um, of electronics products. So I think the reason is that um, we're not being forced to do it yet um, in, in the same way. And also that the recycling market uh, within the European Union is, is quite developed, you could say, in terms of taking these things back through other voluntary uh, organizations, not organizations, voluntary systems that are there. Thank you, I'm gonna stop you there. Uh, Daniela, you will just get a final question before we finish this session on take back systems. Um, what is the best way to implement a take back system? Should that be done alone by the company or in collaboration with other stakeholders? Yeah, that's a really good question. It, it depends on the sector that you are at, also the types of products that you are developing. But Hing Denmark is a very good example from the be beverage industry that got together to develop the take back systems for uh, bottles and uh, drinks packaging. And they actually joined forces and they created a uh, another organization that is a not for profit organization that is responsible for collecting the beverage packaging for all the different brands and then recycling them uh, in, in a proper way. And this is really an advantage for products like uh, packaging because it's really important to ensure harmonization to make it as easy and convenient for the customer as possible. If each brand had their own uh, kiosks where you could deliver the packaging, I'm sure that wouldn't be as efficient and as effective as it is just now. So have a look into the type of product you are developing, the type of infrastructure that you have available in the different countries. Uh, and on the basis of that, look for establishing partnerships, potentially with competitors, but that in that business, you actually be able to uh, 
establish win-win collaborations and get much higher results uh, by doing so. Thank you, Daniela. And actually, fun fact about the Danish uh, bottle recycling system, it was uh, established back in the World War I uh, because it became illegal to smash uh, bottles. Um, I think that's all for, for the questions of, uh, of this topic. We will do a two minute break uh, and transition to the next topic of policy and market. Thank you so much for the questions we got for, for this session. And I hope to see just as much engagement for the next session. See you in a few. See you shortly. <laughs>